safety for well-being. It's hardwired into every person. I can remember when I first heard this, something resonated deep inside of me, this little flame of hope that maybe I wasn't the exception to the rule. That maybe, maybe there's truth to the fact that deep inside of every human being is this perfect potential for well-being. Some people call that your pure soul. I love the metaphors for innate. <clears throat> Some people say there's a divine spark within every person. And you know what your purpose in life is? To fan that spark until you burst into flame, filled with love and compassion and understanding. It makes life more interesting, doesn't it? That what we're about is not about struggling with our lives, struggling with our families, struggling with our kids, struggling to become a little less burdened by all the stress that we happen to walk around in. How about this? How about fanning the flame? Fanning the flame within us that allows us to burst into flame so that the light gets a little stronger. You know, light has been used as a metaphor for the divine within us forever in all cultures. You know the sayings that come out of this? Go to the light. <laughs> when you're dying, they say go to the light. I say while you're living, don't wait, go to the light. Here's another one. Would you please lighten up? <laughs> we get so burdened by thoughts of anxiety and depression, it changes our very posture. and we start sighing a lot. You know that one? I have those days still. <sighs> Feels like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. Innate health. Here's another metaphor for innate health. Within everybody is this perfect radiant sun. You know, light has been used so often for this. There is this sun within, and all of us tend to get caught up in the clouds of our own thinking. And the only thing that can cover over the sun are thought clouds. And that whenever those thought clouds part, the light of consciousness, the divine light, our capacity for well-being begins to shine through us so that when our heads begin to clear of all of the thoughts that weigh on us, what I notice in people all over the world is that people start to feel better and the quality of their thinking improves. In the same way the sun brings us warmth <coughs> and nourishment, and without the sun, nothing could live. And without that divine light within us, that shines through us throughout the day. We don't even recognize it. We have moments of presence, moments of being really there in the world, moments of being wide awake. And then that light shines through. Comes through as a smile or as, as a kindness. I worked with one woman from Jerusalem. She said, I don't have that in me. And it was really amusing to me because she was one of the, she had 11 kids and she was one of the kindest women I had met. And she says, I don't have that with me. We're not used to recognizing that all of life comes through us from within. It's created through us from within. Another way of talking about innate health, it's built into the name of our species. We're human beings. You know what being is? It's pure spirit. 
pure spirit, pure light. We're spiritual beings in a physical body. You've all heard that before, right? Well, that's what I'd like to talk to you about so that I can put some flesh on those bones, if you will, <laughs> so that we can unite, we can become, instead of just humans running around, totally identifying with our experience, that we begin to recognize that we are connected to something greater, something beautiful, something available because we're all already a part of that great divine mystery. We're all being lived by something greater. So we begin to ask, this is a beautiful vision of human beings, that we're all beautiful, perfect, divine beings in this shell of a body, and that we get so caught up in and identified with our own thinking content and feeling content and behavioral content. That's what we call ego. It's a case of mistaken identity. We lose sight of our spiritual nature. So you ask, why does this happen? How does this happen? Well, I like the Jewish story that says when we're in the womb as babies, God comes in and imparts all of all wisdom to that baby. And then after you're born, an angel comes and touches you here, above, just on your lip, and there's you can't see on my face, <laughs> but if I shave, you would see there's a little dimple there from that touch of the angel. And then we forget that we're spiritual beings. And our role in life is to remember our true nature and our true connection. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. <coughs> Do you know, a lot of people say it's hard to have memories from when you're born until you're five. That's the forgetting that happens. Because when we're born, we come into the world and we're wide awake with spirit. The light is on full. We come in, these radiant little babies. I know Almost everybody in this room has probably had the opportunity to hold the baby in their arms and to look into the eyes of the baby. And you can tell they're just this beautiful, pure being of pure consciousness, pure energy, pure life, just waiting to be, to take on a unique and individual form. So you say, well, what happens? Why do we lose this notion that we're spiritual beings? Well, why does this happen? Right? Well, my teacher talked about how easy it is for us to get lost. We're born as babies, and we're born into a physical body, and we open our eyes and we see things, and gradually our minds start developing and we can see things and think about things. So pretty soon it seems like everything has to do with what we can see in the visible world, and we lose sight of that which is invisible. It's very natural for that to happen. It's an inevitability. But we're, we have this incredible opportunity to rediscover what we're truly connected to. Now, I think all of us, as we're growing, we lose sight of our spiritual nature, but I think we're blessed with little glimpses of our true nature, of our divine nature. We're blessed with these little glimpses. I can remember when I was five years old, one of my first memories. I'm with my parents and we're on vacation, and we're in a cabin in the woods and it's the middle of the night and there's a huge thunder and lightning storm and it was loud 
and I woke up and I walked over to the window and I looked out and it was dark and rainy. And all of a sudden, the lightning struck and the whole world lit up brighter than day and then disappeared. And in that moment, I had an experience. It felt like my world of myself disappeared and there was just life, just this incredible feeling of connection with life, a sense of oneness with everything. All was good with the world. In that moment, I was free of concerns and worries. I was free of judgments. Some people call that state of mind love, a mind free of judgments, a free of distortions, free of ideas that are limiting, and you are experiencing life directly as it is, pure consciousness. My teacher said, that's what everybody, whether they know it or not, is looking for, because in those moments of radical openness, we're able to get a glimpse of the divine. We're able to have an insight into something that's bigger, greater, truthful, always been true, and always will be true. Now when I work with people, and I get to go all over the world, and when I work with people, I can see that spark within people. Sometimes we talk about seeing the health in people. I can see that light in people, I know that it's in there. In the same way, on a cloudy day, I know the sun is still there through the clouds. I know that it's still there. And I can see that light in people. And it's very fortunate now that I know what we can teach people that will help people begin to get more and more out of their own limited personal world of thinking. Fall more and more into this space free of the limitations of your thinking, which some people call the now, the eternal now, the present moment, presence, presence, where you can experience the presence of God within you, presence. And we get more and more familiar with that terrain. You get more and more familiar with that space within all of us, free of limitation and judgment and constriction and restriction, free of the limiting ideas we have about ourselves and who we are, so that we can begin to experience life on a broader scale. Now, when I see that happen with clients, remarkable things start to happen. What seemed to be burdensome begins to be free because the only burden we carry is in our thinking. That's the burden that we all carry. If I had a little thought vacuum cleaner and could empty your heads, <laughs> and for a moment you were like a little newborn baby again, free of concepts, free of ideas, you'd see the light shining through very strongly. You'd see our true nature, because it's never gone away. It's always there inside of everyone. It just temporarily gets covered over by our thinking. So I grow up and I start paying more and more attention. I start feeling more and more burdened by life, but I thought it was just part of becoming an adult. It's part of having kids. It's part of having a job. It's part of having responsibilities. It seemed like stress came with the terrain. Right? And people would say, of course you're stressed. Look at everything going on in your life. Look at all that you have to do. Stress is just comes with the territory. It just seemed like it was a given. 
So I graduate from college and I become a high school English teacher. And I was 22 years old and I looked younger than my students. So that on parents' night, when all the parents came in to meet their teachers, I stood in front of the room with my coat and tie, and I actually had hair in those days, right? And I said, hi, thank you for coming in. I'm your student's teacher. And they all laughed because they were sure I was a student playing a trick on them. <laughs> they said, yeah, right, right, right. Oh, that's funny. Where's the teacher? <laughs> but I had something going for me, I think because I looked so young. Here I was teaching 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old kids. I looked about 16 when I started teaching. A lot of the students started coming to talk to me about their difficulties and problems. And I got very interested in what can I share with them that will help them have an easier life. Because they were talking about the struggles they had with their parents or the arguments or the difficulties they were having with other kids in their class, with getting into uh, 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 or, or the degree to which they were feeling insecure. So I'd talk with them and I'd share with them a little bit of what I knew about communication. And there was nothing more rewarding for me when a student would come back and say, what you taught me made things a little easier in my relationships. Boy, was I thrilled. It was like, wow. And I got passionately interested in what can I teach people that will help them have an easier time in life? So I began my search and I read everything I could that promised an easier life. I read every, I read studied religions, I read every book I could find on all the different religions, I read books in psychology, I would go into a bookstore and I, I would have read every book in the religion section and every book in the, in the psychology section. I collected books like crazy, I would buy three books every time I walked into a bookstore. I was constantly reading and studying. What can I share with people? And the more I studied psychology, the more I found that psychology had a pretty dismal view of people. It didn't have this enlightened, innate health, spiritual view of people. It didn't say we're all divine, spiritual beings. It says, you're going to get messed up as you grow up. <laughs> you better just accept it. There's all these external factors that are going to weigh on you. Right? You've got your parenting, you've got the, the influence of the people around you, you've got your circumstances that are going to weigh on you. And they started making lists of things that you could check off that if you had difficulties in your external life, it would guarantee you would have more and more stress in your life. And I started reading through that list, and a lot of those things on the list I had. Right? So I was like, wow. You go, you're born into life, you go through life, life is going to come at you and make you feel worse and worse, and your job is to work as hard as you can to try and get out from underneath the burden life is causing you. <laughs> so I started my work. And I started with four hours of silence every day. Being as open as I could to God, okay, please help me. <laughs> I'm really having trouble here. <laughs> Four hours of contemplative silence every day. I have to get up early because I wanted to get in a couple hours before my kids woke up. And then I had to put in some time at some point an hour in the middle of the day and another point an hour before, after the kids went to bed before I fell asleep. And then I started reading all the books in psychology and what they promised. Here's what you have to do to be healthy. Because you're not healthy. 
you've lost it. The world is wearing away on you and you've got to work hard to build up your well-being. The dreams, the royal road to the unconscious. So I train myself to wake up at the end of REM sleep and I wrote down in the middle of the night five full-length dreams. Now, you got to understand I was married. <laughs> My poor wife. Five times a night I'd be rolling around with the flashlight, <laughs> writing away. <laughs> oh, of course, then the next morning you're stuck with pages and pages and pages of dreams to work on and to try and figure out so that you can become a healthier person. And then I read a book about affirmations. And I had an affirmation journal. And I felt horrible and I'd tell myself, I feel good. <laughs> it didn't quite fit. But I am healthy and happy in spite of my life being as hard as it is. And I had and I put up little stickers everywhere and I'd have my positive affirmations. And then I read books on cognitive psychology. Right? So then I started writing down everything I was thinking, and then I would spend a lot of time working on trying to improve that. You know what that's like? Baking a batch of cookies, burning them, and spending the rest of your day trying to get them back to being good cookies. You know, scraping off the black. <laughs> of course, you don't like the raisins, so you've got to get those out and replace them with chocolate chips. I was working on myself and I started to realize everything in psychology is based on a premise there's something fundamentally wrong with you you don't have well-being and you have to work hard to get it whether you work hard spiritually or psychologically it's going to require a lot of hard work you know how many years I did contemplative silence four hours a day I did 20 years so trying to fit that into my family schedule and I had my dreams to work on and I had my affirmation notebook and I had my cognitive book where I had to work on improving the content of my thinking now this is just the start right I had my structured journals and then I had my unstructured journals <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank God I had the wife I did. <laughs> because she would say to me, Dickon, I have never in my life met a person who works harder on themselves than you do. Now, I thought she was complimenting me. <laughs> that shows you how far out of it I was. Now, here's my wife. She's walking around. She's one of the most calm, loving, compassionate people. And I have the audacity to say to her, you're going nowhere, girl. <laughs> you got to get working, because if you don't work, you won't get there. How do you expect to develop your spiritual nature if you just sit around and don't do anything? <laughs> I had to apologize for about three weeks <laughs> after I went to my first NA health conference, because I realized she was closer to the truth and living the divine life much more fully than I was. And I kept trying to tell her, if you only read all the books I'm reading and do all the things I do, someday, you know, you'll become more loving and compassionate and friendly and... <laughs> well, okay. It's understandable that psychology, like all science, eventually left spirit out of the equation because spirit is invisible and it can't be measured. And as psychology and science thought it was becoming more scientific, it says, let's forget about the part you can't see and can't measure, and let's focus on the part that you can see and can measure. So more and more, there was two very, very, very separate worlds, the spiritual study and nature of the world and the psychological study. 
And the psychological study was based on the premise, you're fundamentally flawed as a human being. You somehow got passed over by God's angel. <laughs> you somehow don't have deep in your soul the divine spirit that is capable of wisdom, that is full, fully aware and awake, that allows you to become more aware and more awake. And that you are, you, you got past over, you don't have within you this creative energy and force that generates everything you think and experience. Somehow we feel we got left out of that equation and we bought into that truth so that psychology and the spiritual world became very separate. Now I know a lot of you have been fortunate to come across people who have found the way in which those two worlds can work together and do work together seamlessly and beautifully. In 1965, I met a man named Sidney Banks. He was an ordinary man. He was a welder. And he, he was so poor growing up, he had to leave school at the end of ninth grade. And he was, by his own admission, he was a very insecure person. So he was shy, he was quiet, he was an extremely hard worker, but he was always in his head and busy and working hard. And one day he was blessed. And he had his first insight, a very profound insight, and he, had, he was saying to someone, I'm so insecure, it's really, really hard for me to just relax and enjoy my life. I'm so insecure. And his friend said to him, you're not insecure. You just think you are. And he had his first insight. He said, what did you say? He said it felt like an explosion went off inside of him. And what he heard was, there is no such thing as unhappiness or insecurity. It's just a temporary creation from thought. I may have to do this. Is that better? Boy, because I can't talk a lot louder. <clears throat> Okay, we'll see how this works. So he had this first insight. I think this insight has implications for every one of us. That we all live in the world of thought. From the moment you're born until you die, you live in the world of thought. It creates Thought is that creative impulse within human beings that generates every moment of our mental activity. It's a divine gift. Without the gift of thought, you couldn't have any experience. What a beautiful gift this is, that with thought we're able to feel happy and sad and joyful and confused and uncertain and have the full range of human experience. The only thing that has the capability of creating is that which has the power to create. If we don't understand this, that the greatest mystery of life, this is what I heard Sid Bank saying was that what he realized, what he realized was that the spiritual nature of life, the spiritual energy of life is what generates every single moment of human experience, no exception. If we understood that, do you know how our lives would change? 
it would be impossible to blame anything in our life for creating. We couldn't say the traffic made us have the feelings we had. We wouldn't say that other people upset us. We wouldn't say that anything that has already been created somehow has the power to create. Could you imagine if I actually had that power to create? I could point somebody and go, sadness, <laughs> anger, hurt, right? It's a delusion, delusions of grandeur that we can create feelings in other people. Right? So here's Sid Bang saying his first major insight was that every bit of his insecurity and unhappiness was just created from thought. So that when the thoughts clear, the unhappiness goes away and it's not being created and it doesn't exist. When it's in your thinking, it's in your feeling. When it's not in your thinking, it's not in your feeling. In order to experience stress, you have to have stressful thoughts. When our head clears of those thoughts, we have a different feeling. If you leave your thinking alone, you have all kinds of feelings during the day. You know what the biggest problem is? People don't know where their experience is coming from. People don't know. I have asked thousands of people all over the world, what are you feeling? And where do you think it comes from? And it doesn't matter if they say I feel good, or if they I say I feel really stressed, or I feel really upset. When I ask them, where do you think it feels good? Not a single one has said it's been created from the divine power of thought. No one has said that ever. People will say, well, I feel the way I do because of circumstance, other people, the world, my background, my history, my genetics, poor parents, it was my parents that made me feel the way I do. So without understanding the true source of our feelings, we get into all kinds of trouble. Let me tell you a little story. When I first learned about the principle of thought, that every bit of my experience is being created from the divine power of thought. I started noticing how much I worried. And if you had asked me, Dickon, why are you worrying? I'd say, I'm not worrying. One time a friend says, Dickon, I think the real problem is you're worrying yourself sick. And I said, I'm not worrying. He says, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I'm thinking about very important issues in my life. You're not suggesting I don't think about those things. <laughs> And he said, well, thinking, what do you call thinking that makes a person really anxious? And for the first time, I saw how much thinking I did that made me anxious. Whoa. This was in my first training. The first night in my hotel room. After the training was over, I said, oh, I call, okay, everybody is talking about how thought creates experience. You live in the feeling of your own thinking. You're always and only living in the feeling of your own thinking. But you have to see this for yourself. You have to see the truth of this for yourself. It doesn't do any good to understand that intellectually. You will be begin to discover, like I did, that the vast majority of the thinking I was doing during the day was generating feelings of worry, tension, stress, or just distraction, where I was being more and more caught up in my thinking. Sometimes I walk down the street and I look and I don't see a single person who's present. Everybody is in their thinking. Thinking, thinking, thinking. And remember, you live in the world of your own, you live in the experience of your own thinking. I started, I started more and more, I started seeing how I was 
caught up in thinking that created the feelings that I was living in. I started seeing when I got really annoyed and bothered with the traffic when I'm driving around. Whoa, could that be thought? And I had a little moment of recognition of what's true and what's always been true and what always will be true. That each of us in every moment is experiencing our own thinking. I started seeing more and more that when I would recognize that, that thinking would tend to naturally flow again and fall away. And when it did, I would feel better. And I wasn't even working on myself. And I wasn't even trying to, I wasn't doing the seven steps. I was just recognizing that I'm a thinker, that I was living in the experience of my thinking. Okay. I go home after my first training and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is the secret to life here. We live in the world of divine thought. And it's, the divine thought is the, the power that is able to create within us. And it's always generating mental activity. And that whatever is going on in our thinking is going to be what we feel and experience. That's where my stress comes from. That's where my anxiety comes from. That's where my bother comes from. That's where my hurt comes from. That's where my happiness comes from. That's where my joy comes from. It's all created by this divine gift that allows us to experience life. Okay, I go home, and here's my kids, and they're arguing. And I walked up to them and said, well, you're both just caught up in some thoughts. <laughs> you're just having a low mood. It's just thought, it's not really real, just let it go, it'll pass. Put yourself in my kid's place. <laughs> Can you imagine if today, later on, you're walking around the hotel and somebody walks up to you and said, I can tell you're thinking. I can tell, and you're making yourself miserable. That's pretty plain. You know how long my kids put up with it? Two weeks. I'm amazed. They have real perseverance, I guess. They put up with it for two weeks, because every time I'd see them upset, I'd go, oh, that's just thought. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to have your thoughts. You're going to have them. But it's not your brother that's making you upset. It's thought. Do not do this at home. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find out very quickly. Trying to teach the principles to your kids is... Uh, that way, it's not necessarily helpful. So my daughter comes to me. She's 14, almost 14 years old, and my almost 8-year-old son, they come to me together. And my daughter says, Dad, Ben and I have been talking. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. She was like the union rep. <laughs> ben and I have been talking, and we've decided... If you say one more word about thought, we're going to run away. <laughs> now, my daughter was very feisty and independent, and I'm pretty sure she would have just to, uh, she would have packed her bags and gone out the front door. And I said, "Oh, sweetie, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry." Because this was helping me so much to realize that my feelings were created from thought. And that any time I recognized that, it would snap me out of it and I would come back into the present moment and I would start to feel better. But I had had that insight and they hadn't had that insight yet. So I said, I am so sorry, I promise you I will never say another word to you about thought ever again unless you ask me. You know how long it took before they asked me? <laughs> six months. But you know what happened? In those six months, I got happier. I got more present. I lightened up. 
I started worrying 20% less than I used to. That's like carrying a backpack of 100 pounds and you take out 20. It's a noticeable difference, right? I started to lighten up, I started to have more fun, I started to enjoy myself more, I started to enjoy my kids more, I started being more present, I started listening better. And after six months, they really noticed that I was changing, so they figured, well, maybe he's on to something. And in their own way, they each asked me. And I can remember one night saying goodnight to my daughter. And she said she was having some difficulty. And she said, Dad, what do you think I can do? And I said, well, I really don't know what to do. But for some reason, I felt like she was giving me permission to say something. And I said, all I know, sweetie, is that the pain we live in is a psychological experience and is created from thought. It's a wonderful gift. It's the only way we can have experience. Nothing happened. I kept thinking, well, maybe that'll do it. All right, I come home, I come home from work the next day, and she comes running up to me. Remember, she's 14. She is what my wife and I affectionately call our little drama queen. Because everything was a tragedy, everything was dramatic, everything was, oh, right? So she would get upset. Like if we said no to her ever, two days, she'd give us the look. <laughs> okay? So she comes running up to me and she says, Dad, Dad, this stuff works. And I say, what do you mean? She said, Dad. I was in the cafeteria, and a friend of mine, this guy, comes up to me, and in front of everybody in the cafeteria, now just think of this, 14 years old, you're in front of all the people in your school, and somebody comes up to you and starts yelling that you've done this horrible, horrible thing in front of everybody. Well, she hadn't done it because she wasn't where it happened. This guy got his story wrong, or he heard from somebody, or the rumor mill, or whatever, but he was accusing her in front of everybody. Now, how do you think a 14-year-old girl would respond if she was being made out to be this horrible person in front of the whole school? Just devastating. She ran out of the cafeteria crying, and all of her friends ran after her and were commiserating. He's a jerk. <laughs> you know, this was one of her best friends. He's a jerk. Pay no attention to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Just cut him out of your life. She was so upset. She kept thinking about it and talking about it all day long. She came home. She was so miserable. She jumped in the shower. And in that moment, her head cleared. And when her head clears is often when we're primed to have new thinking and insights. Remember Svi said, unless you just are relaxed about this or just take it in, just let it come in, don't think about it too hard, don't try and figure it out. At some point, if what we're pointing toward is true, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you it's true, we live in the world created from thought. Our experience of life is created from thought. And if that's true, it'll resonate on, on some level with you. If it is true, please don't take my word for it. I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm suggesting to you that one of the faces of God is the power to create, and God is creating what's happening within our minds, creating what's happening within our bodies. One time, oh, let me finish the story with my daughter. <laughs> it's a cliffhanger. Tune in next week. <laughs> she was terribly upset. She's taking her shower. 
her head clears, and all of a sudden she realizes that for the last four hours, the only thing she had been doing was thinking about what had happened in a way that kept her upset. And as soon as she realized that, she stopped thinking about it, and guess what happened? I mean, just, it's so simple. It's hard to believe it's this simple. Guess what happened when she stopped thinking the thoughts that made her upset? She fell open. She fell open into the now, into the present moment. The present moment is just any moment free of the contamination of our personal thinking. She fell open. And she started to feel better. And she goes, Dad, I can't believe it. It's true. Our feelings are created from thought. The next day, she comes home again. She's all excited. She says, Dad, Dad, all of my friends are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you where I was with a 14-year-old daughter. I went, oh, my God, what are they doing? <laughs> she said, Dad, all of my friends are doing it. They all start thinking about something, get upset, and then they keep thinking about it and talking about it and thinking about it and talking about it. And I want to run up to my friends now and say, I know what happened was horrible, but right now you're not upset because of what happened an hour ago. You're upset because you're still thinking about it. And she says, but Dad, you can't just walk up to somebody <laughs> who's hurting and say to them, it's just thought. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, no, no. you know where you learned that from? And all of a sudden she goes, yeah, <laughs> you did. Well, that one insight made room for this divine spark to shine through more brightly. That's all I can, that's the best way I can describe what happened. She lightened up. She stopped being so burdened by her own thinking. She became more enlightened. How it looked from the outside, she looked like she had transformed from a 14 year old who had the emotionality of an eight year old, very dramatic, very emotional, to being a poised, confident, 40-year-old woman. Every one of our friends came up to us because her voice changed, her posture changed, her confidence came out. It's inside all of us. Just It gets covered over by all these layers of thinking that we begin to think are true. And that when they fall away, and when they really fall away, you'll see more and more of this lightheartedness coming forward. Presence. Presence. Light. Consciousness. Coming forward. You are literally bringing more consciousness into the world. More love, more understanding. So all of our friends kept saying, what happened to Nina? Oh my God, what happened to Nina? She's like a different person. Consciousness. In another word for consciousness, I'm talking about three fundamental principles that as you understand it deeper, it will help you both psychologically and it will bring you closer to God. That's my experience. Consciousness is not just personal, it's divine. It's the very fabric and nature of life is consciousness. All of life, the whole field of the infinite energy of life is uh, a built of consciousness and awareness. So that everything created in life has a degree of consciousness, everything. Now, in a very simple way, in a more practical way, when our head's clear, we become, we, it's like the windshield of our mind gets cleared of all the thinking that was covering it over. It's a little bit like if it's rainy and you're driving your car, you can't see very well. And if, you, if your mind fills up with a lot of personal thought, it gets harder and harder to see. If you get mud on your windshield, 
gets harder and harder to see. And when our windshield is clear, when our mind's clear, we can see clearly again. It's pure and pure consciousness, less contaminated by our own personal thinking. <coughs> My teacher, Sid Banks, says, this is the ultimate answer. It's only when we're resting in pure consciousness that the, we're able to hear the divine clearly and it will speak to us and we get new thinking and fresh thinking and insight and inspiration. It's the ultimate answer. And yet, most adults I see when they're having difficulty don't fall into this space of pure consciousness. They lean into their thinking and they think harder and harder about what's going on and very innocently, they cover over this wisdom that's waiting to break through, like the sun is waiting to break through when the clouds part. A man comes to see me. He was very successful, but he was having difficulty with his son, who was uh, a teenager and always getting into trouble. And this man was very friendly and kind. Oh, I'm gonna speed thing up. How much time do I have? Am I, am I over already? Just a little bit over? I'll speed it up. I'll speed it up. Very, very busy minded. He began to learn about these principles. He began to see thought creating his experience more and more. He began to fall out of his thinking into the now more and more of the time. And resting in the now, in that quiet, in that silence, this is what happened to him. <clears throat> he said, Dickon, when I first met you, I had so much stress in my life, so much stress in my life, and I thought it was because of my job. And now I know it was just how I was thinking about my job and my life. And he said, the highlight of my life up until this point was holding, falling asleep with my grandson on my chest. And he said, I fell asleep with my grandson on my chest. And it was the most peaceful I had felt, the most open, the most connected. He had one of those glimpses of our true nature. He says, that happened to me once in my life between when I was born until I met you. And he says, Dickon, to tell you the truth, I have that experience 50 times during the day now. He says, the feeling that I fall into is so free of stress and so full of love and so full of compassion. And he says, now I bring that into our meetings. And now when I meet with people, I bring that feeling with me. I worked with another man, very successful man, president of a company. He was, he's the one I was uh, starting to tell you about who had so much difficulty with his teenage son who was always getting into trouble. And when he came to see me in the United States, he planned business work before he saw me and business work after he saw me. And as he reflected on these principles and began to reconnect with something greater and began to fall out of more and more of the thought-created experiences he was living in, one day he comes in and, he's, and he takes this big white board and he says, can I draw something for you? And he put a little dot on the center of the board and he said, most of my life, this is who I thought I was. Now I see this as my true nature. My true nature is the connection I have to the spiritual nature of life to God. And he broke into tears. And he said, Dick and I have been having insight after insight. 
I called my son up and I said, I am so sorry. I am so very sorry. I've been so involved in my life and so caught up in my thinking that I couldn't even recognize how much trouble you were in. And, it, and I tell you what, I've canceled all of my business trips and I'm coming home and I'm gonna be with you and I'll be there for you and I'll help you get through this. I can't even imagine what I was thinking that I would leave you when you were having so much difficulty. I'm coming home. And his son burst into tears because his dad had never talked to him that way. So while you're here, relax. You're gonna hear a lot of people talk in a lot of different ways about how we live in the world of thought, how we're conscious beings, and we can tap into a consciousness within us that's pure and clean, and that behind all of that is this divine wisdom waiting to break through into human consciousness. Three principles, thought, consciousness and mind. You can explore any one of those, and the deeper you go into those, the closer you come to God, because they're all three faces of God. So enjoy your time. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you for your patience.